in 2011, I met my wife. I didn't know she was my wife at the time. Just thought she was a pretty girl in the room. <laughs> and a lot has changed since that day where I sat down next to her. She has become the primary relationship in my life. Since meeting her all 10 years ago, we got married half a dozen years ago, have moved a dozen times, uh, about five different states. We have a cat and a dog, and we've done a lot of work to build on that relationship. Also in 2011, I ended up meeting somebody named Ben, who had become a very close friend in my life. We were in each other's weddings, and often we bounce ideas off of each other because we agree on so much together. We're really kind of of the same cloth, if you will. But we're not here to talk about my relationships and my friendships. We're here to talk about faith and, and science. So <clears throat> just put that away in the back of your brain. We're here to talk about faith and science. And you know, some wars that happen between countries, you know, they, they can, you can fight and have a win or a loss in about a week, some months, some of them take years. Other wars take centuries. Some seem like they're never gonna end. And there seems to be a war between faith and science that has gone on basically since Galileo. Since Galileo discovered that the Earth orbits around the sun and not vice versa, it seems like the church has been backpedaling on every new scientific discovery. Every advancement that science makes, it seems like the church has to defend herself. That the church has to say either, oh, we didn't mean that, and we didn't mean it that way, or the church has to double down and say science is wrong. Science is void of truth. And throughout this rocky relationship between science and faith, there have been about five different models of this relationship. The first model is the one that I think we are most familiar with, the one that we are most aware of, and that's the conflict model. If you think of a Venn diagram in those two circles, and you rip them apart, and, and you see science on one side, faith and scripture on the other, and there's no way that the two could ever overlap or talk to each other. That science has nothing to say about scripture or about God, and God and scripture has nothing to say about science. This is the conflict model. And arising out of the conflict model came something known as the separate magisterium model, uh, put forth first by Professor Gould, and he says basically, and I'm paraphrasing here, that science has to deal with truth and facts and data. And scripture and faith has to do with making you feel good, right? Uh, again, I think this is a model that most of us are aware of, even though we probably didn't know its, its name. After that comes constructive integration. Now, this is represented well by the Venn diagram here. This is there's significant overlap. Uh, and where they do overlap, science and scripture, there's a lot of harmony that takes place. An example of this would be in scripture, how uh, often it talks about how God stretches out the skies, stretches out the heavens. And we can see this, we can observe this in the way that the galaxies are all expanding, the way that the universe itself seems to be expanding. And then there are other things that science talks about, but it has nothing to do with scripture and vice versa, right? That you're not gonna go to scripture to find out how a microwave works, but you're gonna want science. So they have no, no problems uh, saying that the earth is old, that it took billions of years, that the earth is probably older than four billion years and the universe older than that. Um, what's very important for um, this camp, this constructive integration model, is that there are creation texts outside of Genesis 1 and 2. And we are going to focus almost solely on creation here today talking about faith and science. 
After the constructive integration, you have the fusion model, which is also known as the hard concordance model. And this is where we get our friends, the young earth creationists. This is where um, our brother Ken Ham belongs. Uh, Ken Ham has an organization called Answers in Genesis, if you want to learn more about it. But they, they believe that it was six literal 24-hour days that we read about in Genesis that God creates. Um, and that the earth is only probably about 6,000 years old, and, and they get that from uh, genealogies, from, from reading in scripture the genealogies and how old people lived back before the flood. <clears throat> and then lastly, we have something called the contemporary model. So the fusion model, excuse me, is if you took that Venn diagram, you took those two circles and you made them one, right? Everything that scripture says, science says. Right? Everything that's in scripture can be validated by science, and everything that science says can be validated in scripture. Okay? Now take that Venn diagram with the complementary model, we roll it out just so the circles are barely touching. Okay? So there isn't really any significant overlap, if any. Um, a lot of people in this camp are known as evolutionary creationists. Science says one thing, scripture says another thing. And the only time that they relate with one another is to kind of complement one another. Now, there's an issue I see with all of these models. Um, first and foremost, I just don't like labels. I don't like belonging and being pigeonholed to a certain set of beliefs. Um, if I had to choose one, I, I'm most akin to the, com uh, the complementary model. Um, because I do find scripture and science saying two different things. The purposes of science and scripture are very different. But what is missing in all of these models is biblical scholarship. There doesn't be, seem to be anybody inviting biblical scholars into these conversations. What I find so ironic is that Ken Ham, our young earth creationist, and, and Richard Dawkins, who is an evolutionary biologist, a brilliant zoologist, um, he authored something called The God Delusion. He's kind of the face of the new atheist camp. They read the Bible the same way. Ken Ham, Richard Dawkins. They pick up scripture and they read it the exact same way. And what's missing is that we have two scientists trying to interpret scripture. They have what's called a poor biblical hermeneutic. And that word hermeneutic doesn't need to scare us. It simply means the interpretive framework in which we have the it's the methodology of interpretation and you have a hermeneutic no matter what you are uh, trying to interpret so this could be uh, you know a painting a sculpture a song it doesn't matter you have a certain methodological way in which you approach the interpretation and this is really significant because how you approach it directly determines what you get out of it and so it, it confuses me to think that we, we lack biblical scholarship when talking about science and faith. And so we should talk about biblical scholarship. We should talk about biblical hermeneutics, particularly as it pertains to Genesis 1 and 2, the creation text of the Holy Bible. The reason that we want to do this is because we need to enter into a different worldview. The original authors and the original audience had a radically different worldview than us. When we bring our worldview to scripture, our methodological way of interpreting scripture, we get all kinds of messed up. We need to understand what the original audience heard and understood and what the original authors meant. So in order to do this, we need different fields. We need archaeologists to discover what their homes were like. What was it like to live? What were their diets like? Um, what were their you know, gatherings like? We need anthropologists to help digest that. We need linguists to be able to interpret ancient Hebrew and ancient Greek. We need all of these biblical scholarships at the table to talk about the intersection of faith and science. And when we dive into that, we see that our ancient Hebrew uh, ancestors, if you will, were surrounded by three different worldviews in Egypt, Babylon, and then greater Samaria. 
Uh, all of this makes up what is known as the ancient Near East. And each of them have their own different creation stories that directly influence the creation story that we find in Genesis. And this is really important to talk about because it isn't talked about. <laughs> it's really important to understand because when we talk about old earth creationism, young earth creationism, when we talk about the science, we need to know first what, what was understood thousands of years ago, before Jesus, before any of us came along. We need to know what they meant. And so in these three stories, let me try to tell you them all wrapped up, okay? In the Egyptian story, we have uh, the god Atum, A-T-U-M, who appears, who just kind of self-emerges in a watery sort of incubator, okay? And these waters symbolize chaos, they symbolize life. But Atum self-emerges and then continues to self-develop. And as this God develops, becomes land, becomes life, he creates, it creates more deities. And this, this deity group together creates the harmony and the balance and the order that we know in our world. So keep that in the back of your mind. Because where did the Hebrews come from? They came out of Egypt. So they were used to these stories. And then they end up in Babylon for a while. And what was it like to be in exile in Babylon? Well, the creation story in Babylon is very violent. It's known as the Enuma Elish. And you have a god Marduk defeating the, the god Tiamat, who is a watery sea dragon. And when I say watery sea dragon, I don't mean a dragon that comes up out of the water. I mean, she was water and she was a dragon. She was utter chaos. And Marduk violently conquers Tiamat by slicing her in half, separating the waters above from the waters below, creating humans out of her blood, AKA the dust of the earth, to be his slaves, to serve Marduk. And those in authority, are divine kings who represent Marduk, or divine priests who represent Marduk, who fill the temple with Marduk's image, who breathe on the idols to make the deity come alive. It is a very violent beginning. Lastly, we have in Sumeria, um, to, to kind of round off the whole ancient Near East where they live, in ancient Sumeria, they begin with a desert wasteland. And when the gods come in, the gods actually bring water. So it's kind of the opposite. Instead of starting with water, life comes from the water here. And the earth gives birth to the plants and the animals and the humans. But it's a dry wasteland and, and the gods don't like it and they have to create out of it. So the differences between these creation stories and these creation myths versus those in Genesis 1 and 2 should absolutely just jump off the page. These crazy differences in Genesis because the Hebrews are a people set apart. They are a people different than their surrounding neighbors. How are they different? Well, Yahweh himself is set apart. First and foremost, Yahweh pre-exists unlike uh, the Egyptian god that self-emerges, right? This is kind of where we get pantheism from, is, is everything formed out of this life. Everything is God and God is everything. But in Genesis 1, we see God hovering above the waters. Utterly different, pre-existing. We see that God says, let there be light, and there is light. It's not violent. He speaks, and it is. In fact, the way he says, let there be, is almost like it's a suggestion. It's, it's in the same way we would say, hey, let's go get a hamburger. It's not a command. It's God's mere suggestions, they have to come into being. Also significantly different is time out. Becomes a light, separates Abraham, there is still chaos. <clears throat> time in. Also significantly different is that God himself becomes the light. When he says, let there be light, he is the light. And, and this isn't, he creates himself in any sort of way. This is 
When God says, let there be light, he enters into creation as light. That's totally different than any of the other ones. None of the other ones do the gods enter into creation in that way. But importantly, and I'm going to skip ahead here to the last one, there is still chaos. God didn't eradicate or violently annihilate the chaos. God speaks into it and then contains it. Now the darkness represents that chaos, and God enters in as light, and he contains the chaos to a certain time period known as night. There's still chaos. And so what does God have to do? Well, he separates Abraham. So after separating light from night, day from night, the waters above from the waters below, after separating the land from the water and the plants from the land and the animals from the animals and the male from the female, in order to create order, God looks and he sees that there's still chaos. And so he separates Abraham out of the chaos of Babylon. What's really significant as it pertains to faith and science here, this has nothing to do with the origin of the universe. Genesis 1 and 2 never intend to tell us about the origin of everything. Rather, they are concerned with the origin of order. Where did Israel come from? They come from Yahweh, a loving God who shares authority with his image. They're not slaves just to worship him. They are co-stewards over his creation. So then, where does this leave us? If, if this doesn't talk about the origin of the universe, then what model do we follow when we talk about faith and science? What, what model is it? Are they in conflict then, or is it contempt or um, complementary? That's none of them. They're not meant to relate to one another. What really depends is my relationship to them. How do I relate to faith and how do I relate to science? You see, the, to ask how do, how do faith and science relate together, is, it's asking a nonsensical question. You're asking, can God make a square triangle? It's a logical impossibility. Faith and science don't go together. What we are asking is a question of worldviews. See, the, the science, I can get into the science. Other scientists can come up here and, and talk better science than I ever could because I'm not trained in the sciences. I'm trained in biblical scholarship. They're not supposed to relate together. So this is, this is why I talked about my relationship with my wife and my relationship with my friend Ben. I have a primary relationship. See, this is a worldview question. I have a primary relationship with my wife. My relationship with my wife actually affects my relationship with Ben, with my friendship, as it should. <laughs> that's, a, that's a healthy thing. That's a good thing. See, it's not about trying to figure out the chaos and make the chaos work. See, this is about understanding what the chaos is separating it and putting it in its proper order. The question is not about which model or which Venn diagram do we ascribe to. The question really becomes through which lens are we going to look? It's supposed to look like glasses. I don't know if it really does, but that's what it's supposed to look like. <laughs> we're, we're not meant to talk about how faith and science do or don't exist together it's a, it's a matter of relationships how do I relate with faith versus how do I relate with science you can only have one primary relationship which one are you going to choose to be the primary relationship right it doesn't mean I'm excluding science but my primary relationship belongs to scripture so that means, that means a lot of things. That means that science can go do what science does and it doesn't affect my faith. That means if I am a Christian and if I want to get into the sciences, I can pursue the sciences without any sort of bias, without any hindrance of it 
hurting my faith. And it means if I'm a Christian, I can relatively trust science without having to worship it. I can trust their data. And see, this is so important because when we think that science is just lies, then we start to question everything. We start to question vaccines. We start to question what should be taught in schools, right? There's a lot at stake in these, in these dialogues and in these conversations. And what I'm offering to you today is that if you put everything in its proper order and have proper relationship with it, these questions aren't so hard to answer anymore. Now, we should always be critical thinkers, always, whether it's for our faith or of our science, we should always be critically thinking and have a healthy skepticism of everything. Now, there's a difference between healthy skepticism and cynicism, but we should still question everything. And I say that because I understand that in our culture, particularly in our country, there's politics and different agendas that can go into our sciences and in our faith. But I'm saying if you go to the sources, if you go to the scriptures, and you ask biblical scholars what scripture is saying, you're going to get a lot of really helpful advice. And if you go to the sciences and you ask scientists, what is the science saying? You're going to get a lot of really helpful advice. But if I go to the scriptures and I turn to a scientist to say, hey, help me understand this, it's not going to be as helpful. And if I go to the sciences and I ask a pastor, what did the sciences say? As a pastor, I can tell you, you're not going to get much. <laughs> We're not good with numbers. <laughs> It's more about the lens through which you look. So with that being said, uh, I do want to open this up for questions. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd love to respond. And I say that intentionally because that does not necessarily mean that I will have an answer to it. Um, and I think that this method, this approach, hermeneutic, um, opens the door for a lot of different possibilities and questions. And um, I, this wasn't really the space to address those right now, but if you have a question about it, I would love to respond to it. Uh, so feel free to drop a comment below and I will do my best to make another video soon about those questions. Um, these are my references, the Bible Project. Please, please, please go check them out. They are amazing. Honestly, most of this can be found in their podcasts. Like Tim Mackey and John, I'm sorry, I forget his last name, are amazing at what they do. Please go check them out. They're awesome. They're so helpful. They take graduate level uh, and honestly doctorate level stuff and they make it super, super easy to understand. So go check them out. They also have really great videos to help you read your Bible. Um, Reasons to believe, the, the five models particularly come from them. Uh, reasons to believe, they, they line up um, as the uh, constructive integration um, led by Dr. Hugh Ross, a uh, very helpful organization. Um, obviously, I don't line up with them, but they're still really great and helpful and you know, brothers and sisters in Christ. And um, Dr. J. Richard Middleton, he was a professor of mine. He taught worldview uh, in college, uh, but he has a great book called The Liberating Image. If you want to learn more about how God uh, shares authority with us, um, really an amazing book. I suggest all of his materials, honestly. Uh, the last thing I want to say <clears throat> is often people say, well, this is not a, a salvation issue, right? That the creation story, whether you're a young earth creationist, old earth creationist, or whatever I just offered up, um, you know, it's all about meeting Jesus and having a, a life changing, a rebirthing encounter with Jesus, right? Uh, to use some Christian language on it. But <clears throat> the factor of the matter is this is a salvation issue. If it's a barrier to people meeting Jesus, it is a salvation issue. And the barrier seems to be that that the church constantly has to backpedal, that the church constantly has to, you know, put its foot down and say, the science is wrong. But with this model, with this idea that 
it's more about the lens that you look through than the model that you ascribe to. It's about how you relate to science and to faith. This model sets those barriers. It just, it, it makes those barriers not even exist anymore. And people can say, well, if I look at scripture and it says that God created in six days and they find out he didn't create in six days and therefore the Bible is wrong. Again, it's just, it's poor hermeneutics, right? It's a bad approach because you're still approaching it from a 21st century mindset. I'm getting off topic. That's probably enough for now. I'll let you ask the questions and um, I'll stop preaching at you. But thanks so much for listening today. Please drop those questions below. Uh, I look forward to, to reading all of those. Thank you so much for your time, guys.